1,500 years of Africa's culture and its greatest civilizations as TLC continues with The World of Television History, next. Nigerian terracottas, 2,000 years old. The magnificent bronzes of Ife and Benin. African civilization has ancient roots and a history that goes back long before Europeans arrived in the 15th century. Africa gave birth to a number of states and empires, especially along the coastal plains of the east and in the west south of the Sahara. Historians are beginning to chart the rise and fall of African civilizations, most of which had no written language. Today, emerging from centuries of colonial rule, all of Africa's nations are young countries. Homo sapiens first appeared over two million years ago in Tanzania. Much later, in Egypt, one of the world's earliest advanced civilizations emerged. The Nile, the same river that saw the rise of Egypt's early civilization, is now the lifeblood of one of Africa's most remote and mysterious peoples, the Dinka. These Dinka women gather fish from the flooded plains of the Sudan in the same way their ancestors may have done in that first Egyptian civilization. The Dinka are part of Africa's fascinating and perplexing time warp. It is only recently that the world has begun to understand the full story of Africa and its people. To Europeans, Africa was the dark continent. Its different nations and tribes were seen at best as children and at worst savages. This narrow-minded perception helped ease the conscience of slave traders and colonialists who exploited the continent. For more than three centuries, Europe indulged in the barbarous market of human flesh. With local cooperation, Europeans streamlined the process, packing generations of Africans into ships like this one. The Portuguese called these ships tomberos, or coffins. By the 18th century, over 70,000 slaves were being transported every year. Today, African culture and history are being re-evaluated. The early Victorian view of Africa as a land of savagery and chaos says more about the Victorian empire builders themselves than it does about the people of Africa. As archeologists continue to dig, it's clear Africa has nurtured cultures and civilizations of a much higher level than previously thought. And for decades, African art and music have permeated everyday life in contemporary Europe and America. To understand the history of Africa, we must first know something of its topography. Three times the size of the United States, Africa covers some 12 million square miles. Much of it is virtually inaccessible. The coastline is rarely broken by bays or gulfs. Only the Nile River is easily navigable from the sea. There are no paths to the interior from the Atlantic or Indian Oceans. Most of the continent is an enormous plateau, broken by broad interior basins stretching almost to the coast. 
in the desert areas and equatorial forests, the extremes of climate make life difficult or impossible for people not accustomed to the heat and humidity. The tropical rainforests run along the equator. There are woodlands and savanna, great dry grasslands, and finally the deserts, the Kalahari in the south and Sahara to the north. For Africa's history, the Sahara is the most significant feature of all. Before 3000 BC, much of the area now called the Sahara was green and fertile. Its inhabitants were hunters at first, and later, in time, cattle herders. Their societies and cultures were stable and developed. But from about 3000 BC on, dramatic changes in the climate destroyed the fertile pasture land and the Sahara expanded. The desert's weather has remained relatively constant for more than 2,000 years. There is ample archaeological evidence, stone artifacts and rock art, that the Sahara once supported large populations. But today, only a few nomadic peoples, like the Tubu who live near the remaining oases, continue to endure the desert's arduous climate. Camel trains still cross the Sahara, following the same familiar routes of ancient times. The climatic change in the Sahara forced the Stone Age peoples in the region to disperse. Some went north and east, contributing to the development of Egyptian civilization. Others migrated south of the Sahara, and became increasingly more isolated as the desert grew. They became part of Black Africa. In addition to this geographic division, there was the historical split between the more powerful sedentary states and the rural nomads. Many of the nomads follow lifestyles today that are little changed since ancestral times. Remote semi-nomadic people like the Dinka now find their survival threatened by the modern Africa that surrounds them. It's small consolation that the Dinka way of life has long outlived the more flamboyant and splendid African empires, none of which survived the arrival of the Europeans. The World, a television history, will continue on TLC. Two of the leading early African kingdoms developed in the northeast of the continent. Egypt, with its capital at Alexandria, and Ethiopia, with its first century AD capital at Aksum. Ethiopia was converted to Christianity in the fourth century, and Aksum remained an important cultural and trading center until about the ninth century, when it was overrun by Muslim invaders. Today, these steely, up to 100 feet high and carved from single slabs of rock, remain to remind the world of the once mighty capital city of Aksum. The capital of Ethiopia was moved south to the mountains, eventually to Lalibola. There, King Lalibola ordered churches to be cut out of the living rock. Some of these churches are still in use today. Archaeology shows that in West Africa, in the savanna country south of the Sahara, iron was in use from about 400 BC on. During the next thousand years, iron production spread throughout the continent. Following the introduction of iron, West African trade expanded, and a succession of states and urban centers rose and fell. Ghana, Mali, Songhai, Hausa, and Kanemborno. Commerce in the area increased dramatically after about AD 1000, buttressed by the well-defined trade routes across the Sahara Desert. One of the most important towns at the southern end of this network was Timbuktu in the Kingdom of Mali. Timbuktu was a university town as well as a trading center. Learning and ideas were so important, in fact, that her merchants made more money from trade in books than they did from anything else. 
By AD 1000, Islam controlled all of North Africa and the states bordering the Southern Sahara. Mali was just one state that benefited from its links with Islam. In 1324, its sultan, Mansa Musa, went on an ostentatious pilgrimage to Mecca, showering gold about him. Mansa's journey appears on this 1375 map made in Christian Majorca. A little to the south, the 14th century saw the rise of Benin, one of Africa's most powerful kingdoms. The bronzes produced at Benin, like this 16th century head of a queen mother, are outstanding. Three centuries earlier, a little to the north, the sculptors of Ife had cast this head of a young man. Both works are a remarkable testament to the artists who produced them. The Beanies of Benin had no written language. Descriptions of their advanced society can be found in the journals of early explorers. They left these bronze plaques as a vivid memorial to their lifestyle. Their king ruled as an absolute monarch, capable of mobilizing 100,000 men on a day's notice. He sent representatives to the Portuguese court. His merchants were the shrewdest of businessmen. The Portuguese and the Dutch were full of admiration for what they saw. To please these early European visitors, the artists of Benin produced masterpieces in ivory, like this 15th century carving. It depicts the sailors and merchants to whom it was designed to appeal. Produced in large numbers, this carving would have cost about as much as a good shirt. The Europeans who bought these earliest souvenirs cleared the way for the start of the slave trade. Gradually, this unnatural commerce destroyed the social and economic framework of Benin. The African kings responded to the decline of their kingdoms in the only way they knew how, conducting more and more human sacrifices. When a British force arrived in Benin City in 1897, they found it deserted and littered with the decaying remains of human sacrificial victims. Benin, land of regal splendor and home of black Africa's most noble art, had passed into history. History still holds the secrets of the creators of these hauntingly mysterious heads, dating from between 500 BC and AD 200. Discovered by archeologists some 50 years ago, they were named the Nok Terracottas after the Nigerian village where they were unearthed. African art often crosses political boundaries. It varies from region to region and reflects centuries-old contact with foreign cultures who've passed through the continent. Away from the more settled communities of West Africa, the nomads of the East produced portable art. Sometimes the art is permanent and indicates family lineage or age status. But no matter what the social purpose, beauty is always a consideration. The World, a television history, will continue on TLC. The coast of East Africa supported powerful urban civilizations between 500 and 1,000 years ago. Two important cities were Kilwa and Gedi. They exported gold, frankincense, skins, and ivory from Africa's hinterland to Arabia and India. Their ships sailed the monsoon winds of the Indian Ocean and returned with ceramics from China and Persia, horses from Arabia, and cottons from India. In 1418, and again in 1422, Kilwa and Gedi were visited by powerful Chinese fleets, whose commanders were curious to verify the rumors of the city's wealth. A century later, 
The same story of unbounded riches attracted the Portuguese warships, whose artillery quickly destroyed forever these dangerous trading rivals. On the ruins of Kilwa and Gedi, the Portuguese built fortresses to ensure there would be no recovery. These mighty walls are all that remain of another vanished African civilization. In the 14th century, Great Zimbabwe was one of the most powerful and impressive states in Southern Africa. Its wealth derived from gold, ivory, and extensive mineral deposits. Great Zimbabwe was built by the Bantu, the most dominant racial group in Africa today. About 1800 years ago, they began to spread south from their homeland in the Cameroon until they controlled most of Southern Africa. The people they displaced, the San and the Khoikhoi, were pushed south. They were hunters, and the Bantu were mainly farmers. Small numbers of San continued to live in the Kalahari Desert. In the caves of Southern Africa, their ancestors left vivid reminders of their way of life. Cattle have always been a symbol of wealth and well-being in Africa. They still are today. The Maasai of southern Kenya and northern Tanzania measure wealth in terms of cattle and children. Money has its uses, but it's relatively unimportant in a society that's so essentially rootless. The Maasai spend their lives around their cattle. They believe God gave them ownership and stewardship of all the cattle on the earth. It may be tempting to view the history of the continent as the rise and fall of empires, but another side of Africa's story can still be seen today in the lifestyles of its nomadic peoples. Nomads may have no place in the African drive for prosperity and efficiency. Many governments are pursuing policies that will soon eradicate their way of life. These nomads provide a rare glimpse into a very distant past. Every year, the rains turn the swamps of the Sudan into an inland sea. The southern Sudan gets over 50 inches of rain a year. During the months of flooding, the Dinka retreat with their cattle to higher ground, just as their ancestors did. The Dinka tribes are spread out all over the Sudan, in groups that vary in size from 1,000 to 30,000. At the start of the dry season, from December to April, they return. Visitors to the Dinka in the late 19th century were surprised to find no kings, courts, or government. The British colonial rulers employed anthropologists to identify natural leaders who could be made into local officials. The anthropologists found that Dinkas recognize no leaders. Instead, the cattle camp forms the nucleus of Dinka society. Every individual within their society instinctively understands the role he or she has to play. The survival of the cattle camp in a hostile environment like the sued swamps with its flooding, insects, and disease demonstrates the strength of Dinka society. Because much of Africa's history is unwritten, it has to be reconstructed in other ways like observing local rites. Every year, the young girls of Swaziland in southeastern Africa take part in a ceremonial dance and symbolically donate reeds to build the Queen Mother's house. By looking at rural traditions like the annual reed dance of Swaziland, anthropologists can begin to understand something of Africa's human story. The continent's life, in essence, is wrapped up in the land, the people, and their tribal traditions. The earliest explorers glimpsed truths about Africa that others who came later would refuse to see or acknowledge. In 1498, Vasco da Gama and his men went ashore on the east coast of Africa and found tall stone cities where the people knew as much about charts and compasses as the Portuguese did themselves. For mercenary reasons, the Europeans who came afterwards neither understood the continent nor wanted to. They ignored the accomplishments of Africa's civilizations, 
and created the myth of darkest Africa and the white man's grave. African culture fared poorly as a consequence of contact with Europeans. For over 300 years, her people were ravaged by the transatlantic slave trade. European states divided up the continent among themselves and created colonies that ignored all the natural and historical divisions of race, religion, language, and culture. In today's era of blossoming independence and democracy, that colonial legacy can be overcome. Africa has its best chance in centuries to blend tradition with the modern world and recapture its once proud history. Before the Europeans arrived, a host of great cultures dominated the Americas. Look back next on The World, a television history. before the Europeans, read The Dawn of African History by Roland Oliver.